Hey there, I just wanted to let you know that on October 29th at 7 p.m. Central, I'm hosting an online get together where we're gonna noodle on how to navigate an accelerated retirement. I'll be sharing some wisdom that I've learned through my practice and answering your questions, so I would love for you to join me. And you can do that by going to livewithroger.com. Now on with the show. I received an email the other day from someone that said simply, my job has been eliminated, can we chat? Having your job eliminated when you're on the verge of retirement may be the push you need to embrace the next season. But what if you're not ready to retire, either professionally, personally, or financially? What do you do? That's what we're going to talk about today on the Retirement Answer Man Show. Hey, welcome to the show. Glad that you're here. We're finishing up this series on an unexpected retirement. And today we're going to talk about how do you fill the gap if you have lost your job, but you're not ready to retire, whether it's financially, professionally, or personally, or what have you. How do you fill the gap and get restarted professionally. It's a really important topic. And by the way, I'm looking forward to hanging out with you tomorrow on our live. We call it a webinar. It's really just a get together where I'll have some opening comments and we're going to just going to talk and I'll try to answer questions and maybe we can help each other navigate how to prepare for an unexpected retirement that may occur or one that you're going through right now. So I'm excited about that. And you can learn more about that or register at livewithroger.com. And we'll be doing more of these in the future, so that'll be cool. And in the Rock Retirement Club here over the last few weeks, we've been doing something new, which we call a sprint. And because we were doing this series on the show about unexpected retirement, we set a three-week sprint where members of the club that are dealing with an unexpected retirement can work together over three weeks to take action. And so we have about 18 people in that sprint where we're addressing financial, non-financial issues, and then finally setting for each individual person an action they can take to start to take a step forward. So we're really excited about this new feature of these sprints that we're doing inside the club so we can take little baby steps together. In the future, we're going to have sprints on filling up tax brackets, purpose in retirement, building out your pie cake that members can opt into. So you can check all that out at rockretirementclub.com. With that, let's go to our main section and talk about how do you fill the gap if you're not ready to retire. Let's just say it. Losing a job sucks. It's even worse if you're not ready for retirement. There's the practical reasons why it sucks. But I think internally, it never feels good to be acted upon in that way. Losing your job, even if it's just the machine of corporate culture and where things are on the line, sometimes we take it personally. Because I'm, we all try to do a great job, and that can really zap your confidence, even if it had nothing to do with you, which it most likely didn't. It's a business decision. And so when you lose your job, and we know we have to go back to work for whatever reason, we got to make sure we shore up and realize it's not about us. We don't need to take it personally. We need to shore that up. But it can be difficult because losing a job and having your position eliminated tends to happen quickly. It's like one of those things that is very slow in building, sort of like a wave out into the ocean. But as it gets closer, it speeds up and all, it feels like it happens all of a sudden. And when it happens all of a sudden, what happens to you? Well, you lose your connections with the people you work with. You lose the professional purpose that you had. We all like to have a task to do, a project to work on, something to make improvements on. We lose that very quickly. We lose the rhythm of our life. 
waking up, going to work, having meetings, enjoying the collaboration, coming home, eating dinner, that goes away very quickly if your job's eliminated. So in addition to losing the connection of the people you work with every day, losing the purpose that you focus on every day to challenge yourself intellectually, to grow, and losing your rhythm. So now you're just waking up and you're in the house. What do you do? In addition to all that, you lose your income, the lifeblood of paying for your life, paying your electric bill, your mortgage, the upcoming trip to wherever. It feels like all of your dreams have just been zapped. And you're wondering how you're going to be able to stay afloat cash flow wise now that the income, the the life preserver that keeps you above water. That's a lot of how it can feel. Now, the initial thing that you need to do is what we talked about in episode three, four, six, which was the first episode of this month, that triage to start to get the pieces together, to start to figure out the puzzle. So definitely refer back to that. And now it's definitely the time where you need to focus first on self-care. I don't care how practical you are. Self-care is really important. You need your family. You need your friends. You need to let them help lift you up and support you as you're going through this major change of losing all the things that we just talked about. I tend to like, when I'm under stress, here's what I do. I journal. I'm not a regular journaler. I aspire to be. But when I think back to the most stressful parts of my life, personally and professionally, when I really feel like I'm floundering, I yell into pages. I mind map. I think I, I just express myself in pages and it helps me get it out. And I never let anybody read it. I don't know if I've ever really gone back and read it but you don't want to keep it in. And sometimes you want to have the strong front, the organized front for your family because they depend on you in a lot of ways, but you need to have an outlet. And writing for me is very helpful. And there's a form of writing that you might want to try with this. And it's called free writing. There's like books on it. There's books on everything nowadays. But free writing is essentially start writing, continue to write, don't lift lift your pen up, don't worry about grammar, don't worry about punctuation. If you don't know what to say or your mind wanders somewhere else, just go with that. There has to be no rhyme or reason. If you're writing about losing your job and all of a sudden you think about your dog and the walk you had, just start writing about that and then come back to it. The idea is just to stop self-filtering. I found that helpful. So consider that because you're going to need to have an outlet. Affirmations and building up your your self-confidence and realizing that it's not about you is definitely very helpful. And lastly, it's really baby steps. And in our sprint in the Rock Retirement Club, That's essentially what we, the whole sprint is about is brainstorming areas in the financial life and in the non-financial life that are a biggest concern or have a big impact and then choosing a sprint or a baby step we can take on one or two items so we can just have forward motion. Because when you lose your job or you're thrust into a situation where you're out of your rhythm, You flounder, and I I use that metaphor of being in the ocean. When you're moving forward in some way, that motion can help you redirect as you start to figure things out. But when you're sitting, treading water, trying to stay above the water to breathe, is when you're most without agency, when you're most vulnerable 
So any kind of forward motion. And so the key is these baby steps. And we've talked about that in episode three, four, six. So let's talk about some practical things to fill the gap. If your job has been eliminated and you know you got to go back to work for whatever reason. So first off, let's talk about cash flow. You've lost your income and hopefully you got some type of package or severance to get you through. But you're going to have to restart that income image or engine to pay the bills or to continue saving towards your goals. Obviously, unemployment is something you need to explore. If you are really tight and don't have cash reserves to weather two or three months without work, which the majority of Americans are in that situation, they can't, they don't have emergency savings to absorb the impact of these kinds of things. So if you're in that situation, any kind of income helps. So here are some just practical examples if you're in that situation. Register at temp agencies, manpower, and other temp agencies can help you find part-time contract work, even if it's not in your specialty and may seem beneath you. Register there because there are, they also have a lot of temp to perm jobs, and maybe you can get into a company doing one thing and start to work your way into really what your sweet spot is. Declutter your house and sell things on OfferUp and eBay, etc. Start to use the excess time that you have to declutter and maybe earn a little extra money. I'm telling you, even small amounts of money coming in psychologically help a lot. They help you build agency, which is critical here. There's a gentleman in the, in the club who is dealing with an industry that's really been impacted by COVID, where his normal employment is gone for the foreseeable future. And he's delivering Uber Eats and driving Uber and Lyft. And he actually has talked very fondly about it, how he's reconnected with people. Uber Eats, Uber, delivering food, delivering groceries, all sorts of things have popped up that are temporary in nature that can still help you cash flow wise. Consider a Starbucks. If you're dealing with not just simply lack of income, but you need benefits of some sort, if Starbucks is a great example. Both of my kids work at Starbucks and they will pay for health care. They'll give you fairly affordable health care. After a period of time, they will give you stock. After a period of time, they will pay or subsidize your education at Arizona State University. That's what my, my daughter is doing. Now, as an adult, you may just need the income and the health care. It's something to consider. You could tutor online. You could take surveys, teach English remotely. Things that you've never imagined can help build cash flow if you need to fill that gap quickly. What, what about going forward in terms of your job search? How do you start to take action there to find that next position? Well, I think the first thing you want to do, other than before you go out to your network necessarily, is to update your resume. Because maybe you haven't done that in a while. And honestly, most resumes are lacking. My wife was in HR for decades. She worked at Manpower, managed a region for Manpower. She was in executive technology recruiting. And so I asked her some tips on resume writing, and here's what she recommended. When you're looking at your resume, she said, number one, look for keywords in the jobs that you want. So you want to form your resume to the position that you're applying for. Gone are the days where you have one resume that you just use for everything. You have one base resume, and then we, as you're applying to jobs based on job descriptions, you want to tweak those so they're very appropriate to the actual position that you're hiring. Set number two is review resume examples for the job that you want. So if you have a particular profession, you can go online now and get examples for that particular job, and then you can compare how yours is to something in that particular industry or field. Number three is make it 
simple, and easy to read. Very important. Don't let it be cluttered. Even if you're extremely talented, you want to be very concise. When you talk about your work, she suggests that you make all of your accomplishments very measurable based on percentages increase, efficiency. You want to show actual results rather than just the description of the things that you created. So Focus on accomplishments and some measurable way of how you helped increase something. She said, put the most important information first and have only the last 10 years within your resume, because most likely you've worked a very long period of time. And the last thing that she suggests is to Google 139 action verbs. So if you Google 139 action verbs and just in Google, you want to have action verbs in your resume. It brings them to life, which will help your resume stand out. And it, this is an interesting discussion because my wife and I have been talking about this because we just opened a search for an administrative assistant in my advisory practice and had to write our job description. And she's explained to me somewhat how this process works. Because what's going to happen most likely when you submit your resume, whether it's online or through a service, is the first tripwire or review is going to be by likely somebody that may not even work at the company. It could be somebody overseas that is just going to filter all the resumes for keywords and requirements before it even goes to the company for review. And this is very common. We had an experience with a friend whose daughter worked at a a hospital locally, a VA hospital, as an intern while she was in nursing school, and they loved her. And so as she was coming out of nursing school, she applied for the position at the hospital, and she was really concerned because nobody ever contacted her. She didn't get through the screens to get interviewed for the permanent position even though everybody wanted her. And so she continued her job search and ended up getting a job at another hospital. And then she finally said something to the people that she was working with, wondering, what, hey, what's the deal? I thought you guys really liked me. And like, oh, we do. And what had happened was her resume had gone through the initial screener. The particular keyword or requirements didn't fit. And so she never got down to the actual HR department because it was a third party that wasn't even associated with the hospital that had no relationship with her that had screened her out. So she never got down and they were so they wanted her, but she had already accepted a position somewhere else. So you want to understand what those keywords are and you want to bring these to life. And so those are some just very simple things you can do from a resume standpoint to freshen yourself up as you go down this job search Now, once you've done that, you want to update your LinkedIn profile, and then you can start reaching out to past connections, personally, professionally, to let people know that you're on the hunt. And that is a very powerful way of finding the right position that gets you out of the normal cattle call through submitting your resumes online for job postings. I think of Virtually everybody I've hired, it went this way. Nicole, I'll use Nicole Mills as an example. I was looking for somebody that was an administrative assistant and never posted it. I reached out to my network of people in the industry and just said, hey, I'm looking for somebody. This is roughly the bullet points of what I'm looking for. If you know of anybody, let me know. And a mutual friend in the industry connected us, and that's how Nicole got hired. So once you have your resume and you've made it come to life and you've made it action-oriented, start distributing that with a note to personal and professional people in your network because they may know of somebody that's looking for an amazing person like you. Those are enough action items to get started. So hopefully that's helping you figure out how to fill the gap And then that coupled with, you know, the triage things that I suggest that you do in episode three, four, six, you'll be well on your way of swimming forward and you may not find your shore immediately, 
but you're going to feel more empowered and you're going to be taking action and you will. I truly believe that. With that, let's go talk to BW and Coach's Corner. So I'm really excited that BW, Beachwalker, head coach of the Rock Retirement Club, is with us today because I just had my 30th anniversary and BW is here to help us talk about changing relationships with your spouse. 30 years. That's pretty good, Roger. Yeah, that's it makes me feel a little old, to be honest with you. Shauna should be congratulated. It's quite a milestone for her. We both did, we don't usually don't drink during the week, but we decided, oh, we both need a drink. 30 years, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say changing relationships with your spouse and related to retirement, what do you mean by that? This all started about over 20 years ago, a physician in Japan actually started seeing some really alarming health symptoms among his female patients. There was depression, headaches, ulcers, stress-induced rashes. Finally, after putting it all together, he determined they were suffering from the same ailment, all of them, and he named it the retired husband syndrome. This is a real thing, believe it or not, Roger. Now, in the U.S., we suffer from what we call gray divorce. Gray divorce. I've never heard that. Yeah, there was a Pew Research Center study in 2017 that found that the divorce rate among adults 50 and over in the U.S. had doubled since 1990. It's even worse for those over 65. The divorce rate there had almost tripled in that same time period. So the retirement research community has been looking at this and trying to figure out what's going on. And basically, we all know this, retirement's very much an emotional time. You lose your identity, your predictable schedule is gone. You're with your spouse, you're no longer just spending an hour or two a day together at the end of the evening when you both come home and are tired from work. Now that you're retired, you're both together all day long day in, day out, all day in, all day out. And it can just be too much for some couples. Roger, I'm going to let you in on a secret. It's possible that you're hard to live with during that time. I think this COVID disruption has given us a window into where we're at on all that. And the divorce rates are up a lot this year, if you look at the numbers all across the board. So yeah, not just retirees are experiencing this same syndrome. I've always thought of this as in past generations, I think of my grandfather, not that they didn't have, they had a great marriage, but when they retired, it was a short time frame. So it was very easy, even if the relationship was not perfect to stick it out with pensions and everything else. And now if you retire at 60, you could be living with that person for 30, 40 years. Exactly. You'll be celebrating your 60th or 70th. And you're like, is this really what I want for the rest of my life? So I've always said one of the best, you know, two best investments you can make is in your health and in your relationship, meaning your marriage. So what do we do? The first thing we do is we don't wait till we're retired to start thinking about this, right? The research all shows that the reason people are divorcing, it's not some new problem in their marriage. In other words, the marriage you Mm -hmm. had before you retired is the same marriage you have after you retire. It's just easier before you retire to avoid the issues, avoid having discussions. As I said, you're not seeing each other, but you're both rushed in the evening and you don't have that much time together. But everything is intensified when you're retired. And those little issues that were nagging one or both of you, can really become a problem. The second thing is, as you said, your relationships really are going to change when you're retired. Maybe one spouse has been doing, and I I don't want to ask you any real personal questions, Roger, but is there one of of the partners in your marriage that does most of the household chores, or are they evenly divided? Right now, I'm actually a a very big cleaner. I like doing dishes and things like that. 
So traditionally, I've done my share of vacuuming, and I like tidiness, although I'm looking at my Uh office and I need to work on that. But over the last year or so, after Shauna left her career, it has changed in that she is managing the household much more than she did in the past rather than sharing it. And I am doing, well, this stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. And most couples have established some sort of division of labor, if you will, of the household responsibilities. And usually, studies show, it falls more on one partner than the other. Guess what? When you retire, you ought to redivide those household chores, right? It's no longer fair. It's, hey, I'm retired too, is the answer you get if you don't do that. Obviously, it, the burden often falls on the female member who more often has retired earlier, maybe to take care of children or things. And so you just got to think about that if the husband is retiring or one of the partners is retiring. I don't want to make this too gender specific because it really works both ways. And I also should say you really need to think about this not just as married couples, even single folks, whether you are single voluntarily or involuntarily, have a primary relationship in their life. They need to have that. And the same kind of pressures that we're talking about applies equally to them as well. So this is really, when you go into retirement, your relationships become intensified. I was having a meeting the other day with a potential client, actually, husband and wife. She just retired And it was very clear that she was the financial steward of the family and managed all the the finances because he didn't say anything. And whether it's household chores or the financial management and organization of things, it's the same thing. You sort of you need to bring both spouses into the conversation, regardless of who traditionally had the role of that particular topic, right? Whether it's doing the dishes or reviewing your investments. And it doesn't mean they ha- the, that division has to change. It just means both partners need to be comfortable with it going forward. In other words, you need to have the conversation about that. Yeah. Let me you throw it at you. So when, since you've retired, because you retired, you're rec- more recently retired, how have you readjusted some of those things, whether it's financial yeah, or I mean, dishes? I clearly do more around the house than I did while I was working. My wife had quit working, oh, 20 some years earlier when our children were young to take care of them. And she pretty much managed the household, mainly in retirement. I still try to stay out of her way. <laughs> she doesn't like me in the kitchen too much. And so, we, yeah, we've certainly redivided things. A lot of the things we were doing, we've kept the same, but we did talk about it. And that's the key is to have that discussion. The other big thing, is what do you want to do in retirement? If one spouse has been out working and say traveling, doing travel three nights a week, maybe that person just wants to relax where the other one's ready to take off and see the world. You need to have these discussions. What are your expectations in retirement? If one of you just wants to slow down and rest and the other wants to go, you've got some conversations you need to get through. I have a couple of thoughts on that, just from personal experience. One is, I think it's important to have a common something, activity. Mm -hmm. Like with Shauna and I over the last two years, it's been golf. So pretty religiously, once a week, we play golf. And golf is fun. I enjoy golf. I, I enjoy lots of outdoor activities. But what I really enjoy and what she really enjoys is we're riding in the cart It creates space for conversation in an organized way. I think having that ritual of things. I have one client where every Sunday night they go to the same restaurant, sit at the bar and have dinner and just decompress together. So I don't know. I think it's important to have that one thing. I agree. And hopefully more than one. And what I recommend to people in retirement is come up with some new activities that you can take on together. That's great. We do a lot of walking together. We accomplish what you're doing, not in the golf cart, but out on walks and enjoy that a lot. But we've also taken up some new travels and things that 
we didn't do before retirement that have been really good and helped us bond. You're right. You have a lot more time to accomplish and getting that intimacy back in your relationship and talking to each other. And it, you need to schedule it. Yeah. And it can be just, hard. It can be hard. Yeah. Uh, I think the second thing is, and my wife has been wonderful about this. And I, actually, I think it goes both ways. I'll call myself wonderful too. And that is she has her mom and her twin sister here local. And they are really connected. So she spends a lot of time. I don't know how you go to a store and spend three hours in a Target just browsing. I don't know how that works, but it creates the social space for all the jokes and the fun. And then on the flip side, all of my adventure stuff, going to Mongolia, mountain biking, hiking, I do a lot of things she has no interest in. And we've been very comfortable giving each other the space to go do things that we don't have an interest in, but we know feeds those the soul of that particular person. Yeah, Roger, you put your finger on another very important part of this topic, and that is to what extent are you both going to do things together? And to what extent do you not only want, but need to have space, have time to do things apart? And again, it's another conversation you need to have with your partner to make sure you're both comfortable with that. I know some couples who do not travel apart from each other. They just, it's amazing. Whereas I might take off on a golf trip with some buddies for three or four days, two or three times a year. You've never invited me on one of those, by the way. So just well, a side I need, note. I need, to, I need to see your game a little bit before <laughs> we do that, Roger. But yeah, we'd love to have you come on the, one of those trips. But it's really having that conversation and understanding what each party's expectations are. If you don't talk about it and then you're off doing things on your own, your spouse is going to think what? Well, he or she doesn't want to spend time with me. That's not the case at all. And different. People have different needs about spending time alone, spending time with friends, spending time with and without your spouse. So it's just the important thing is to talk about it. And different people have different needs on how they're affirmed by people they want to be affirmed by. Absolutely. And your spouse is, and I recognize this in myself, and I recognize it with Shauna, (laughs) luckily be not early on. I didn't, it was more difficult early on of, I know how I need to be affirmed by Shauna. And I think she's figured it out. And I think vice versa, because when we weren't doing that, because we didn't understand it was that old to model. It was, it could be stressful because you're not getting what you want from your spouse. Yeah. We all have a need to be, appreciated to be needed. And you're right. Learning how to show that to each other in the way that they need it is important part of being a good spouse. A great example is a man, and I can think of one, I won't name him, who the way he shows it is by doing things, fixing stuff for people. That's how he shows that he cares about people. But if the receiving spouse needs the verbal affirmation, I love you, or a hug, the house can be immaculate and everything can be fixed and it's not conveying the message. There's a disconnect. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Learning how to communicate with each other and what each other's needs are and how to take care of them. So the last issue here on this, the big issue that retirees tend to face that you need to start having conversations, hopefully before you retire, is where do you want to live in retirement? Because again, this is an area that we see spouses often have very different desires. Before we move on here, I want to take a little sidebar, okay? And just say, BW, I affirm you. I appreciate you. You are important to me. That means a lot to me, Roger. Thank you. Okay, Now, now we can move on. So where you live in retirement, and this can be as simple as someone just wanting to downsize the home and stay in the same area to someone wanting to head off to the beach or the mountains and the other partner not wanting to do that. And so you need to have these conversations or 
what happens and the reason we see gray divorce is one partner assumes that when we retire, we're moving to wherever. And the other partner says, no, I think I want to stay close to the kids and the grandkids. So again, communication is the key. And really that's, if you don't have the little slightly uncomfortable conversations, that just means it's going to lead to a bigger conversation later on. And so I have a question for you. Okay. Because it's hard to have uncomfortable little conversations. I find it hard, even though I know I need to. And it's easy to just avoid them because you don't want it. Generally, you don't want to increase friction. You don't mind friction. And I appreciate that about you. And I tend not to. But with a spouse, how do you engage or have a slightly uncomfortable little conversation that can be productive? Sure. The first thing you do is you choose a good time to have that conversation. In other words, don't do it during a time of stress or when the issue has, whatever the issue is you need to talk about, don't do it when that issue is has arisen. Wait till things have calmed down. For you, it's maybe next week on the golf course, you're going to have that conversation. But it's important to make an appointment and keep it to have these conversations. In other words, don't, you can't just wait for them to happen. You want to plan and you're not planning unilaterally. You're planning together. Hey, we we need to talk about this. Let's do it. Let's do it on the golf course next Friday. The second thing, and this is important with all communication, but especially among your most important partners, give each other your full attention. Really listen and hear what they're saying. No distractions. Don't have any around. Just listen and be a good listener. Never stop and just say, I don't care. Do whatever you want. That's the worst response you can give when you're having these kinds of conversations. Because if it's important to your spouse and you say, okay, I give up, whatever. You've given up on the relationship. It's not the issue at that point. You've said, I don't care about your feelings enough to engage with you on this, so I'm just going to concede. That's not a good response. So never give up and and say you don't care. And I think a lot of it on the listener end is, I know this happens to me all the time, a lot of times we aren't necessarily great at expressing ourselves in what the real issues are. A lot of times they get masked by a higher level that we have to, as a listener have to say, what is really the issue that they're saying? They're going right. to present it as something, but what really is the issue? And we yeah, have to be in tune to that. Yeah. Hopefully spouses are good enough to intuit that. And I think generally they are. You, If you're not paying enough attention to know that, you're probably not going to have a marriage that lasts. But at the end of the day, and you've had these conversations, you and you've really listened to each other, it doesn't mean you're both going to agree on everything, but it does mean you need to come up with a solution that you can both live with and are comfortable with. And if you've heard each other, truly heard each other, you can do that on most things. Wonderful advice, as always. BW? Have a great autumn, Roger. I will do that. I think I need to go chat with my wife. On your marks, get set. And we're off to take a smart sprint that you can do over the next seven days to rock retirement and life. So over the next seven days, if you're finding yourself having to fill the gap, pick one or two actions that we talked about today and take action. You can do a lot of things very quickly when you're focused and motivated. Now, if you are not in this situation... Keep your eyes and ears open to your friends and colleagues for people that may be. Because maybe you can connect them with someone that needs them. I've had the the privilege to be able to do this. And if you keep your eyes and ears open, you can really help connect people. So I think regardless of where you're at, we can all focus on helping navigate this unexpected retirement or job elimination thing, whether you're taking an early retirement and you're set or whether you know somebody that's in need. So 
Those are your actions. Let's go get started. So next month, November, is going to be all about listener questions. You. All we're going to do for the entire month is answer your questions. And Nicole is going to come and help me do that. So I'm excited to have her back on the show for a little bit. We have a ton of great questions. Hope to see you tomorrow at livewithroger.com. And I hope you have a great day. Hey, it's time for that all important disclaimer. We so appreciate you listening to the show and love your questions and love the teaching that we're able to provide here. And actually it helps us too. But remember, you're not our clients. Not love it if you took advice from yeah, us on we the would show. Not, we would not love it if you took advice from us on the show. Realize this is helpful in education. Talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before you make any decisions. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.